Hey there, welcome back. Uh, in this video, what I want to take a look at is what we call the chain rule. And the chain rule is a method by which we can take the derivative of a composition. All right, now up to this point, uh, 3.1, we talked about derivatives of you know, polynomial-esque terms, right? x to a power, we call that the power rule. We took the derivative of e to the x, the base e exponential. Uh, we took derivatives of trigonometric functions. Uh, we talked about the product rule, the quotient rule, the sum and difference rule. So what we haven't looked at are compositions. So that's what we're going to do in this video. We're also going to take a look at, we're going to come back and take a look at exponentials that are not base e. So we'll look at something like you know, 5 to the x. So first of all, the chain rule. The chain rule deals with functions that are composed. So remember back in, let's say, an algebra class, you would use circle notation to denote symbolically the composition of f and g, and I prefer to use what I call the nested notation, f composed of g of x. So this implies in order of operations that f, that we evaluate g of x first, and then that gets plugged into f uh, as its input. A uh, quick example, we might have had f of x equals x squared. Uh, let's say we had g of x equals 3x plus 1. So in an algebra class, you might have been asked to find, let me say, f composed with g. Right? You might have been asked to find f composed with g. So the way that I like to write that is the nested form, f composed with g of x. So again, we would evaluate the g function first. So we would, in essence, take g as 3x plus 1, and then we would plug this into the f function. Right? So the output of the g function becomes the input to the f function. So the f function takes its input and squares it. So it's going to take the input of 3x plus 1 and square it. And that would be what we call a composition. Now in calculus, what we're going to do is we're going to look at finding the derivative of this composed function. Right? And how would we deal with that? So up to this point, we have not looked at functions that are nested in that manner. And that's what we're going to consider right? Um, in this video. The method in which we evaluate this is called the chain rule. Now, a uh, couple different ways for us to write the chain rule. Um, Leave me alone. Right, a couple different ways to write the chain rule. Uh, usually in a textbook, you'll see something along this lines. I want, to, I want to discuss both manners. So we could have the derivative with respect to x of a composition. I'm going to write the nested form. And the chain rule says we're going to take the derivative of the outer function, the outer function being f, and we're not going to touch the inner yet. So we're going to take the derivative of the outer and then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inner. Right? So again, this is saying basically the derivative of the outside right, times derivative of the inside. It's one way we can read this. So let's take a look at this example that we have here if we were going to apply the chain rule. So the example we have here is the function 3x plus 1 squared. So what I want to do symbolically is, right, let's just say that, let me switch to green, let's say we're going to take the derivative of 3x plus 1 squared. I'm going to use brackets just to emphasize the operation here. So we're taking the function, 3x plus 1 quantity squared, and we're differentiating that. Now, the chain rule requires me to identify, really, what's the outer function, what's the inner function. And, and from what we did first when we started this operation, right, we noted that the outer function, right, the outer function was the square, and the inner function was 3x plus 1. So the outer function is the square. That's what we're differentiating first. We're differentiating the square function. So when I differentiate the square function, how do I handle that? So when I differentiate the square function, I bring the exponent down, and then I take one away. So there's me differentiating the square function. Now, this rule says that once you differentiate the outer, you don't touch the inner with the composition. So this 3x plus 1, I'm going to write it in a really tiny font, right? just to emphasize we are not touching the inside of the composition yet. 
we're only differentiating the outer function. We evaluate that at the inner. Now, we're going to take the derivative of the inside. So for us, in this particular example, the derivative of the inside is, well, the, we're taking the derivative of the inside. So we're taking the derivative of 3x plus 1. All right, so now when I differentiate 3x plus 1, what do I get? The derivative of 3x is 3. The derivative of 1 is 0. So I have 2 times 3x plus 1. This is to the first power, right? And the derivative of 3x plus 1 is 3. So my derivative in this case is 3 times 2, which is 6 times 3x plus 1. There's the derivative, oops, 3x plus 1, 6 times 3x plus 1. And that's utilizing the chain rule. And the version of the chain rule we used was that nested form. Right, let me scroll back up, and we can see that here. Right? So in blue is the chain rule written in a nested form, and then here's an example uh, in green that we're using. Now, I do want to come back and do this derivative in the way we would have done it back in the 3.1 video. So in other words, if I was differentiating this expression back in the 3.1 video, the first thing I would have had to do is FOIL out this expression. I did not know the chain rule back in that video. I would have had to FOIL that expression. So back in the video for 3.1, right, if I was finding the derivative, let me switch to red, and if I was finding the derivative of 3x plus 1 squared, I would first have to do a little bit of side work. right? So I'm, I'm going to come over here in gray, and the first thing I would have to do is square 3x plus 1. So if I square 3x plus 1, you know, that's 3x times 3x, which is 9x squared. And I'm going to get plus 3x plus 3x plus 6x, and then 1 times 1 is 1. So again, back in a video prior, instead of differentiating with the chain rule, which we didn't know, we would have had to do some algebraic manipulation before we could differentiate. Right? And then now at this point, you know, the derivative of sum is the sum of the derivatives, and then I would be doing the derivative of powers here, which I would use the power rule, right? So I would end up with uh, 9 times, and the derivative of x squared is 2x, and then the derivative of 6x is 6, and the derivative, you know, of 1 is 0. So what we end up with in this particular example is 18x plus 6, and if I take the 6 out, we see we get the exact same answer that we got using the chain rule. Let's see if I can scroll back up and we can see that we can. Look, so here in green, we got 6 times 3x plus 1, and we get the same thing doing algebra to avoid the chain rule. Now, obviously, in this section, we don't want to avoid the chain rule. The chain rule is a more efficient way to evaluate derivatives of compositions. But I wanted to do this example in the old school way because it was possible, it was not difficult to square this expression. And just to show that we would get the same answer. Now, what if this was more difficult, right? What if this was 3x plus 1 to the 12th power? Obviously, what I don't want to do is multiply 3x plus 1 times itself 12 times. That would be insanity, right? So let's point out to ourselves the convenience of the chain rule right, in that type of situation, right? So let's suppose, uh, you know, we have y equals, let's do 3x plus 1 to the 12th, right? And let's find y prime. So what is the outer function here? The outer function is the 12th exponent. The inner function is the 3x plus 1. So when I look at my composition here, right, the outer function is the 12th exponent, and the inner function is 3x plus 1. So if I'm following the rules of the chain rule, right, I'm going to take the derivative, oops, I'm sorry, x to the 12th, that was the outer function. So if I'm following the chain rule, it says take the derivative of the outer function first, so I'm going to bring the 12 down, and I'm going to take one away. And again, I'm not touching the inside, so I'm going to write really tiny font 3x plus 1 to just emphasize I'm not touching the inside yet. So here's the derivative of the outside and then times the derivative of the inside. 
we talked about prior, the derivative of 3x plus 1 is 3 plus 0. Right? So the derivative here is 3. So I'm going to have 12 3x plus 1 to the 11th and then times 3. And then obviously, you know, 3 times 12 is 36, and then 3x plus 1 to the 11th. So again, here's a situation where we couldn't avoid the chain rule. We had a really huge exponent. Where did it go? 12th power. And so we just had to use the chain rule in this situation. So let's take a look at a couple other examples here. And I want to just pick some problems where we have to do, you know, maybe a product rule or a quotient rule uh, inside some of the other problems uh, that we're going to take a look at. So let's take a look at something like this. Uh, let's say we want to find the derivative of. Uh, let's say we have. Let's say we have h of t equals e to the uh, secant of t and what we want to find is dh dt. Again, I'm trying to use different letters here. Right? So h is my output, that's my dependent variable, t is my independent variable, so I'm taking the derivative of uh, the dependent with respect to the independent. Again, this is like dy dx, taking the derivative of h with respect to t. So this is a chain rule. Right? Now this one's a little bit more difficult to identify what the inside and the outside are. But the inside is the E function and the, excuse me, the outside is the E function. The inside is the trig function. Look, and here's one way to think about this, right? Uh, if I plug a number in for T, what is the first operation I do? That's the inside. What's the second operation I do? That's the outside. So for example, if I plug in, let's say, 0 for t, what's the first thing I do with my order of operation here? The first thing I'm going to do is find the secant of 0, and that's 1. right? So the inside is the first operation. There's my inside. And then the outside would be the next operation in my order of operation. So secant of 0 is 1, and then I would do e to that number, and that's my outer function. So one way to identify what's inner, what's outer, is to think of orders of operations. Right? Now, when I take the derivative, I have dh dt. So I'm going to have the derivative of the outer function. What's the derivative of e to the x? Well, that's e to the x. Right? Now, remember, I don't want to touch the inside. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So the derivative of e to the secant t is e to the secant t. Then I multiply by the derivative of the inner function. All right? So here's derivative of the outer, right? Here's the derivative of the outer. e to the x is e to the x. In this case, that's my quote unquote x. And then I multiply by the derivative of the inside. Derivative of secant is secant tangent. So I have e to the secant t, you know, times secant times tangent. And there is dh dt for the function e to the power of secant t. OK, uh, let's do a couple more examples. Right, We're having so much fun with this. Why stop? Let's do a couple more examples. Let's make them a little bit more intricate uh, each time that we do this. Actually, you know what? I want to stop for a second. And I want to come back and present to you the chain rule uh, in a slightly different manner. So just for review, right? what we had written earlier was that the derivative of f composed with g of x was the derivative of the outside, don't touch the inside, times the derivative of the inside. The example that we used was f of x equals x squared and g of x equals 3x plus 1. That was our first example. So what I'm going to do is frame this conversation in a different way. So there's two ways a calculus textbook presents the chain rule for you. This nested version is the one I prefer. 
right? and it's one of the two that you'll typically see in a calculus textbook. Now let's talk about the other version uh, that we could use as well. Okay, so this looks a little weird, um, but go with me for a second. All right, so in, in the different frame diversion, what we do is we keep g of x as a function of x. So we'd say g of x is 3x plus 1. And what we would do is we would change the dependent variable, excuse me, the independent variable on the outer function. Now, uh, there's a reason for this, and I'll show you in a second. But let's think of the algebra of the composition that we would do here. So if we did f composed with g, what that would look like is f composed with g of x notationally. So we would evaluate the inside function first. g of x is 3x plus 1. And then I would take this input and plug it into the function f. So the advantage to this other notation, right, is it gets us away from thinking of just the variable x every time. And so what we're doing is we're taking this input and plugging it into f. So what does f do to its input? It squares it. So I'm going to take the input of 3x plus 1, and I'm going to plug it in, and I'm going to square that. And it looks just like we wrote it before. Now, I'm going to come back, and we're going to write this in a little bit different of a way. So I'm going to take out my uh, digital eraser. Now I'm going to come back, and instead of calling this g of x, I'm going to call this u. So I'm going to say this is u of x. So when I do f composed with g, what I'm really doing is f composed with u. So in this notation, the g of x is what we're really calling u of x. Now, when I get to this step, it's the same process, right? What is the u of x function? The u of x function is 3x plus 1. So I evaluate u of x as 3x plus 1. And then same thing. I'm going to take the u function. I'm going to plug it into the f function, and I square it. Now, here's the reason that we write it in this manner. So when I take the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner, we're going to represent this a little bit different symbolically. In this case, right, the derivative of the outer function is f prime. Right? So what I'm going to do then is the derivative of f with respect to u. So I'm going to do this. right? I'm going to say my f prime evaluated at g times g prime. Right. Here's how we're writing this now. So the f prime, the outer function, is f as a function of u. So we're taking the derivative of f as a function of u. So we get df du. Then what we're going to do is take the derivative of the inner function. So the inner function is the g, but remember the way we wrote this, the inner function is the u. So u is a function of x. u is a function of x. So we're going to take the derivative of u with respect to x. So this is another way that we can represent the chain rule. We can represent the chain rule in this nested version that we have here, or we can represent the chain rule using the Leibniz notation. Right? So this nested version uses Newton's prime notation. The Leibniz notation looks like this. Here's what's kind of cool about the Leibniz notation. You can kind of see that the du's cancel out in a way, although that's not really algebraically legal. And what we're ending up with is the derivative of f with respect to x. And that's what we had here, the derivative of f with respect to x. So whichever notation you prefer, you know, stick with that notation. You'll see this Leibniz notation quite extensively when we get to the integration chapter. And usually in a Calc 3 class, we'll see this notation as well when we start to do partial derivatives. But for now, pick the one that's convenient, that's comfortable for you, and stick with that. All right, so um, what I want you to do for me here is a, a problem on your own. So let's say we have uh, f of theta, and the function we're looking at is sine squared of theta. 
Now I want you to find the derivative for me. I want you to find uh, df d theta, right? Derivative of f with respect to theta. I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint to get started here. When we have a trig function, the way that we usually write, we have a trig function to an exponent, the way that we usually write it is we think of sine squared, right? Because that's really what we're doing. We're finding the sine of the angle, then we're squaring that number. So we're finding the sine of the angle, then we're squaring that number. So I'm, I'm going to shut up for a moment, pause the video, you try this one, and then unpause and let's see if we match. Okay, so now that you've unpaused the video, let's take a look at this together. Now, when I do chain rules, I like to do what what I did with you uh, when those first couple examples. I like to say it in words. So when I take the derivative of this expression, I'm going to think of what's the outer, what's the inner, and then I'm going to do derivative of the outer times derivative of the inner. So when I look at this, right, again, um, what I mentioned a couple minutes ago was how do you identify which one's outer, which one's inner? And if we plug a number in, it's the first operation we would make that's the inner, and then the second operation we would make is the outer. So let's suppose I plug, you know, theta equals zero into this expression. So I'm finding f of zero. So if I plug zero into theta, the first thing I'm going to do is find the sine of zero. So that is my inner, and then once I find sine of zero, I'm then going to square that value. Right? So my inner is sine theta, my outer is the square. So when I find f of theta, when I find df d theta, I mean, right? we're going to do the derivative of the outer. So we said the derivative of the outer is the square. So I'm going to take the two, I'm going to bring it in front, and then I'm going to subtract one. I'm not going to write the one there, right? but that's what we have. And then I'm not touching the inside, so I'm going to write in really tiny font the inside because I'm only differentiating the outside in that step. Then I multiply by the derivative of the inside. So we know the derivative of sine is cosine of theta. So what we end up with here is 2 times sine theta times cosine theta. All right, is that what you got? Are you matching me? Okay. Now, remember, little coaching conversation real quick, right? Uh, in these videos, I don't make mistakes, right? I'm doing these problems, and I'm getting the right answer every single time. This is modeling an unrealistic workflow for you. So when you do the homework, it's going to be, you know, not every problem are you going to get the right answer every single time. Know that you're going to make mistakes. And the the expectation for you here is to accept that. Give yourself permission to make mistakes. That is totally okay. That's part of the learning process. When we make mistakes, we learn from those mistakes. All right, so just to revisit a conversation we talked about, I think back in the 3.1 video, which was checking our answer. So one thing I can do is use graphing technology to check my answer. So that equation that we just took the derivative of was sine of x squared, right? That was what I took the derivative of. And then what a uh, cool thing about desmos.com, right? That's what I'm using here. Cool thing about desmos.com is I can use f and I can use the apostrophe on my keyboard and graph f prime. So it's graphing the derivative f prime. Now I don't really want to graph the original function. So I'm going to click here and turn that off. And what I want to do is compare with my answer. So we got 2 sine x, I'm going to like parentheses here, 2 sine x times cosine x. So here's my version of the derivative. Here's Desmos's version of the derivative. And if I turn this one off, we can see the red is Desmos's version. And when I turn mine on, we can see mine is identical. It lies right on top of the original graph. So my answer is equivalent to the calculator's answer. So again, the reason I mention that to you, right, is you know, a lot of students in calculus use the solutions manual. There isn't necessarily anything wrong with that. Sometimes you're doing an even number in the textbook and you don't have the problem worked out for you. So it's always nice to utilize some technology to help you check your answer. And again, there's times where you're going to make mistakes and graphing will help you catch a mistake right if my answer was only 2 sine of x that's the answer that I got then I would see the calculator's version is different than my version and I would go oh this derivative of 2 sine x is not correct right
So we definitely want to get in the habit of checking our work whenever possible and going back and finding mistakes that we made. All right, I want to do a couple more examples for you here and then stop this video. So in this example, I want to introduce the concept of what we call a differential equation. And this is one of the coolest things about why we learn about derivatives. All right, remember, uh, a derivative is a rate of change of a function. <clears throat> so those of you that are going to go on into a differential equations course, you're going to look at equations that involve functions and their derivatives. So let's take a look at an example, uh, uh, as simple of an example that we can come up for the moment of, of what a differential equation is. So usually in an algebra course, you talk about population growth or exponential growth. Right? And usually the way they write the exponential growth is y equals y sub 0 e to the kt. Uh, sometimes they'll write that is p of t right, for population, p sub 0, e to the kt. And depending on the book, you might see different symbols. Both of these equations describe the same thing, that if I have some initial population, the population will grow in an exponential manner. And we call the k the growth constant, right? So k is the growth constant. It's usually, again, what most books will say about that letter. So this says the same thing, y sub 0 is the initial value, and then k is the growth value. Now usually in algebra class they just tell you that exponential growth, right? And if I were to graph either of these equations, I see an exponential function, and they would say this is exponential growth. So here's e to the kt, y sub 0 times e to the kt, and I get exponential growth. And they don't describe for you where that comes from. And the reason they don't is because it involves conversations of calculus. So let's come back. Let's revisit this conversation of exponential growth and let's talk about some calculus and where this model would come from. All right, so uh, what most algebra books, right, and what we'll discuss here uh, initially is what we call uninhibited growth. So there's nothing slowing the growth down of whatever population we're considering, right? Let, let's think about, you know, rabbits that live in Arizona. So we're assuming, first of all, that there's no disease, so the rabbits can produce um, without really any deaths. Uh, we assume there's unlimited food, right? So rabbits aren't starving to death. Nothing's limiting the growth. Uh, and, you know, there's no foxes eating the rabbits, right? So again, the growth is uninhibited. There's nothing slowing the growth in any way, shape, or form. Now, when we describe growth in that manner, the way we can typically write it is we say the population grows, so the rate of change of population, the derivative of the population, is proportional to the amount of the population. Now the way that we might describe that here is we might say the growth of the population is proportional to the amount of the population present. Now technically this is a function of time, right? Population is growing over time, right? These are functions of time, if you will. Now, if we think about in comparison, right, let's suppose I have, uh, I, I'm looking at two cities in Arizona that are really far apart, right? One city, I have, let's say, 10 rabbits that I put in that city, and I start my experiment, and I measure, look at how the growth of the population occurs. So I'm starting with 10 rabbits. And then in this other city, I put 1,000 rabbits, and I look at the growth of that population. Well, hopefully it's intuitive that the city with the thousand rabbits is going to grow quicker. The city with 10 rabbits is going to grow slower. So what we're saying with this equation here is that the growth of the population, the growth of the population is proportional to how much there is in the population. Right? The growth of the population is proportional to the amount in the population. So the smaller amount of rabbits, the slower the growth will be. The more rabbits we start with, the higher the growth will be. So here's a differential equation. Now, usually the way that we would write a differential equation in a differential equations course is we'd say this is y prime, and then this is the function y. So we're looking for what is the function that satisfies this equation? You know, is this the sine function? Is this the quadratic function, so on and so forth. So what are the solutions to this differential equation? Well, we technically already know the solution, right? We said the solution was this guy right here. Here was my solution, y equals y sub 0, e to the kt. 
So if I take this function and I plug it into this differential equation, it will satisfy the equation. It is the solution to exponential growth. So let's take a look at what that looks like, right? So we're being told, we already know from algebra, that this equation, this equation, is the solution to this differential equation. So how do I verify this is a solution? Well, I'm going to take the y equation, and I'm going to plug it into y. And I'm going to plug in the derivative. So I need to find the derivative of this equation. So what's the derivative of this equation? Well, let me come over here for a second. What if I had 3e to the 7t? What would the derivative of this equation be? I would pull the constant off, and I would differentiate e to the 7t. And then what's the derivative of e to the 7t? Well, that would be the chain rule. So I would take the derivative of the outer. The derivative of e is e. And then I would multiply by the derivative of the inner. So I would end up with 3e to the 7t times 7. And that would be 21e to the 7t. The reason that I did this is I wanted to point out that the coefficient is just a numerical value. y sub 0 is just a numerical value. It's the initial population. 7 is like the k value. This is the growth constant. It is a numerical value. This is a numerical value. So when I differentiate this function, I'm going to have the constant, the derivative of the exponential, is the exponential, and then times the derivative of the inside. So y prime, in this case, is, let's say, k y naught e to the kt. Here's the function y that we're going to plug into the differential equation. Here's the function y prime that we're going to plug in to the differential equation. So my differential equation was y prime equals k times y. So let's plug in y prime, k, y sub 0, e to the kt. And that equals k times the y equation. So here's the y equation. I scrolled up a little too far. Here's my y equation, y sub 0, e to the kt. And we can see pretty easily here that these two things are equal to each other. k, y sub 0, e to the kt, is equal to k, y sub 0, e to the kt. So in other words, this function has satisfied the differential equation. When I plug the function into my differential equation, it satisfies it. We have verified that the exponential growth model satisfies this differential equation. So this example illustrates what a differential equation is. Population growth, assuming the growth of population is proportional to the amount present. Right? We have nothing inhibiting the growth. Then that is an exponential function. That is exponential growth. Now, the reason that I wanted to discuss this with you was twofold. One, I wanted to introduce to you the idea of a differential equation. And the second was, I wanted to have a function where we did the chain rule. We had to do the chain rule on e to the kt in order to find its derivative. So anyway, two reasons why I picked that problem. One was the really more fun aspect of discussing the differential equation. That's a lot of fun. I can't wait till you guys take a differential equations course. And then we could look at a chain rule of what it meant to differentiate that exponential. OK, so for the length of this video, I think that's all I want to discuss with you. This is the chain rule. In the next video, we will look at implicit differentiation. And then the following video, we'll take a look at logarithmic differentiation. And that should come really close to putting us at the end of our overall conversation of derivatives of all different types of functions. I'll see you in the next video.